This hack tip is brought to you by Jack Threads. Welcome to Hack Tip, the show where we break down the concepts, tools, and techniques for hackers, gurus, and IT ninjas. I'm your host, Darren Kitchen, and today, today we are continuing on our WPA cracking adventure with a little bit of knowledge here on some more of the fundamentals of this ubiquitous wireless protocol we all love, Wi-Fi. I mean, as we know it, it's a standard for wireless communications, but the actual term Wi-Fi is a trademark of the Wi-Fi Alliance. Uh, they're a trade association that promotes wireless LAN technologies and certifies products. The actual term Wi-Fi was adopted in 1999 as a branding term because, come on, it's a bit catchier than IEEE 802.11, and it's kind of considered an acronym for wireless fidelity. The Alliance actually used the phrase as an advertising slogan back in the day, but they quit using that pretty early on. So if you've seen the Wi-Fi certified logo on a device, well, that basically means that it's completed the Wi-Fi Alliance's interoperability certification. Of course, Wi-Fi, for the most part, is synonymous with IEEE 802.11, which comes in many flavors. But let's take a moment here to understand where they all came from and how it all came to be. You see, the story of Wi-Fi, or IEEE 802.11, actually began, well, based on our viewer survey before half of you were born. Yeah, okay, so back in 1985, the FCC released what is known as the ISM ban for unlicensed use. This means anybody could use these frequencies. The ISM stands for Industrial, Scientific, and Medical, and it's a radio band reserved all over the world for those purposes. For example, a microwave creates a lot of electromagnetic interference, so they've reserved specific frequencies and, well, that's why microwaves interfere with radios, like Wi-Fi, Hooray, and Bluetooth. Okay, anyway, so those, the two ranges that uh, interest us the most are actually 902 to 928 megahertz, as well as our beloved 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. The former is, the, is only unlicensed by uh, but what the ITU considers Region 2. So the ITU is the International Telecommunications Union. They do a whole bunch of fun stuff. And uh, Region 2 is basically North America, South America, Greenland, and the Eastern Pacific Islands. So anyway, with that spectrum now available, our favorite corporation, AT&T, began working on a wireless technology in 1991, uh, Waveland. It's now known as Waveland Classic, and it operated in the 900 megahertz spectrum. It was developed in the Netherlands initially as a technology for cashier systems and supported one to two megabits per second data rates. It wasn't actually until 1997 that the first 802.11 protocol made its debut. Uh, appropriately named 802.11 TAC 1997, or sometimes referred to as 802.11 Legacy, it too only supported one and two megabits per second data rates and is effectively obsolete. Of course, this brings us to the lettered protocols that we know and love today. In 1999, two protocols, 802.11a and 802.11b hit the scene. Both a and b offered much higher data rates than their predecessors, the former clocking in at 54 megabits per second, while the latter a mere 11 megabits per second. Another major differentiator are the frequencies that were used by the technologies. B took advantage of the commonly used 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, while A avoids congestion in the 5 gigahertz band. Now, that brings us to 802.11a, also known as 802.11a TAC 1999, and it's a really beefy and kind of robust protocol. It's more resilient to you know, poor channel conditions because it uses what's known as orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. It's, it's basically the very same method used today in ADSL lines, power line communications, WiMAX, digital TV, and a bunch of other cool technologies that we just take for granted today. But due to the complexities in manufacturing processes, 802.11a products were kind of considered late to market at the time. And while the technology offers higher data rates than 802.11b, the signal range was kind of much lower just due to the inherent fact that the uh, wavelengths are much smaller in the 5 gigahertz band and didn't penetrate walls and stuff like that as easily. Now, 802.11a was mostly adopted in enterprises who needed the higher data rates, though today it's quite common to see dual band or dual mode access points supporting both A as well as B and G and whatever else. All right, so 802.11b, or 802.11b tech 1999. 
It was widely adopted all over the world in mid-1999 and is kind of considered the first mainstream wireless networking protocol. And unlike A, B uses the same media access control method as 802.11 legacy. Yikes, it's known as CSMA slash CA. We'll get back to that in just a second. So while 802.11b had a maximum data rate of 11 megabits per second, the added protocol overhead meant that the best you could achieve with like a normal TCP stream is just under 6 megabits per second. Or if you're using UDP, just over 7 megabits per second. All right, so what's a CSMA CA? Well, it stands for Carrier Sense Multiple Access with collision avoidance. And basically, it's a mean for multiple access points and stations to communicate with each other without talking all over each other. It's nice, but carrier sense multiple access, it's basically a media access control protocol, and it uses what's called a, like a probabilities to kind of make a best guess at when a radio should talk. So the carrier sensing part, that's the means for the radio to listen in for other signals from other stations transmitting, and then go ahead and wait for them to finish before you know, it begins transmitting. The multiple access is, well, just that. It just means that the protocol is for more than just two parties. And then the collision avoidance is a modification to it that uses, well, a little less of, of the frequency when it notices that there's a whole bunch of other people trying to, you know, a bunch of traffic congestion. How sweet is that? Okay, well, check this out in just a bit. We're going to go ahead into the next protocol and this week's giveaway. But first, let's take a quick break. We all know that most guys hate shopping for clothes, but luckily, now there's Jack Threads. Jack Threads is a members only online shopping club that does the dirty work for you, saving you a boatload of cash. Every day, Jack Threads serves up the hottest brands at up to 80% off what you would pay in store. And now, Jack Threads is a private only club, but luckily, Hack Five's got the hookup for you. Oh yeah, and did we mention it's free to join? Hit up jackthreads.com slash hack5 and you'll instantly start saving without even having to leave the house. That brings us to 802.11g, which was ratified in 2003, bringing the best of both worlds between 802.11a and b. The new standard, it takes advantage of the 2.4 gigahertz band while using the more robust orthogonal frequency division multiplexing transmission scheme. So with a maximum data rate of 54 megabits per second and backwards compatibility with 802.11b, the g protocol was adopted in droves by consumers at the start of 2003, before it was even completely ratified. I know. 802.11g isn't without its issues though. As part of backwards compatibility, transmissions from other 802.11b stations will actually reduce the network as a whole down to the older 11 megabit per second rate. And the 2.4 gigahertz band is still susceptible to interference from microwaves, Bluetooth devices, baby monitors, and other junk in the spectrum. And the protocol, well, its high popularity is also a bit of a problem in densely populated areas as there's only three channels, well, at least in the US, that don't overlap but we'll get into channels later. Anyway, next week, we're going to wrap up the protocols with our new favorite, 802.11n, as well as going over channels and finally digging into the actual frames and a lesson on BSSIDs and ESSIDs with a practical example in Backtrack Linux. And I hope you guys have enjoyed learning a bit of the backstory here. I find that while I could just spend five minutes telling you what commands to type in to crack a key, it's so much more important to understand why it is that those commands do what they do. Now, before I get going, it's time for the giveaway. Last week, I asked for the manufacturer of my favorite USB Wi-Fi device based on the OUI, and YouTube commenter Joking Tiger was the first to answer with Real Tech Semiconductor Corporation. So we'll be getting you one of those radios out in just a bit. But first, it's time for this week's. I'd like to know now, what 802.11b channel is only available in Japan? Be the first to answer in the comments and we'll get you one of the radios that I use here on Hack Tip. And as always, we value your feedback and suggestions, so if you've got a tip to share with us, email tips at hack5.org and be sure to check out our sister show, Hack 5, for more great stuff just like this. I'll be there reminding you to trust your techno lust. Hey Paul, is it cool if I make up for last week? <laughs>